All right, um, I fished my favorite flag out, I have to say. So we're, we decided to do a, a, a little um, Ignite Talk um, experiment about why we think InterSource is important to us. Originally, it was going to be um, so it was going to be Georg and me and Jim Jagalski, but Jim is missing in action. He he stopped talking to us a while back. Um, <laughs> we think he's just busy, so um, so we're going to do it without him. So so Robert has agreed to uh, to join us and do a third one. Um, for those of you that don't know, Lightning Talk is a five minute talk, and it's a game that we play in this community. We so we teach a lightning talk, or I mean, sorry, ignite talk uh, behaviors to each other because it helps us uh, communicate quicker and, and it's a smart thing to do. It makes your speaking skills better. So anyway, we thought we would challenge ourselves to do this and he's gonna start in a second and then I am going to talk to, <laughs> I'll move over here so I can actually see the slides. Um, I'm going to talk to the slides as they go by. This is why InterSource is important to me. Go ahead. Okay, so first of all, I think we can agree that software is eating the world. Is there anybody who disagrees with that? No, I think it's pretty obvious that it is. It's a nice little world too, so I hope it doesn't, you know, really eat it all completely. We're waiting for my slide to change now. Is it going to? Yes. The reason that open source uh, is important is because it enabled a lot of the innovation that's allowing software to eat the world right now. And so, you know, when we started thinking about, about these methods, open source wasn't proven yet, but now it is. Everybody knows that. Unfortunately, a number of our brethren are not, our engineering brethren, are not able to engage with open source. They are still working in the salt mines. And that is a very sad thing for me. As a lifelong open source activist, I would like to see that change. And there's some reasons why, but first I thought you should um, enjoy Mr. Hamill's quote here. Basically, it's bad business to allow your engineering resources to linger in this inefficient way of working at this point. And almost all of my, my trajectory is about that. I notice from my work inside of companies that company culture is kind of like tectonic plates. And over time, they, you know, they harden and then they break. And then stuff starts oozing out of them. And... Um, one of the things that really contributes to that is ownership culture, in which most companies that adopt ownership culture think they're doing a good thing. They think that they're gonna increase quality and craftsmanship by investing more ownership. But actually, it is an anti-pattern, in my opinion, because it creates silos. So pretty soon, there are these you know, cones of silence between teams, and they're not interested in talking to each other or collaborating anymore. And if, if they could each you know, get everything they needed to get done done without inter interdependency, that would be fine. But in reality, it just creates this crazy traffic jams um, and a lot of people sitting around waiting for other people to get work done because when you rely on feature requests instead of pull requests, you are offloading and then sitting around, offloading your expectations and then sitting around. Another problem is the whole blind men and the elephant problem, right? It's hard to know what the software is if you can't read the code. <laughs> And you get no full stack knowledge in your company as long as you keep code from being re readable. Another big problem we see in companies is uh, top-down planning. So at the same time that companies are thinking they want to adopt Agile, they're still engaging in top-down planning and the two are antithetical to each other. I mean, the whole point is to give the engineers a little more freedom so they don't feel like this because there's starting to be companies that don't make their engineers feel like this and it's pretty easy to move to them. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy if you start imprisoning your artists, your, your, your best engineers. Um, and then, of course, there's the problem of escalation, which we always draw the bo bosses as cheeses, wedges of cheese. Um, in companies with a lot of top-down planning, there's also often a lot of executive escalation, which is really time costly and ridiculous. So how would we get to delight? How would we get to the Turkish delight of engineering? If we, had a, if we had an opportunity to think this over again. Um, I hope all of you don't hate Turkish Delight. I actually really like it quite a bit. <laughs> and I thought it was a nice counterpoint to the cheese. Um, first of all, help engineers reconnect with their passion. People who are happy at work do a lot better work. And passion drives much better behaviors in general. So InterSource does this. It allows people to solve their own problems. It also uh, creates an accretion of documentation naturally just through the process of people mentoring each other 
And that documentation is better than the one that you got the engineers to write under duress because it's actionable and it's engineer to engineer. And then, of course, there's the problem of the teams that you hire and whether they're functional or not. I don't know if you guys know about the Silicon Valley kids, but that's a very dysfunctional startup there. Um, I think what we're finding uh, as regards hiring is we have two, two populations we're helping. One is interns and acu-hires. These are people from outside your company that you just acquired or brought in, and they're very confused about why your engineering is so old-fashioned, and they're unhappy about it, and they really want it to change. And the other one is people who already work for you who need to learn new skills. You kind of owe them teach, you know, continuing to grow them as, uh, as employees for yourself and for other companies, right? So InterSource is important to me because it solves all these problems if you implement it properly. And if you do it right, all the boats will rise, which is really what we're looking for here. So that is why InterSource is important to me. And um, if it sounds like something that might work in your company or that would be important to you, then I'm going to suggest that you come to InterSource Commons. You can reach out to me if you want more information or to any of the people that are going to speak here today. And so thank you very much for listening. And that's how an, an Ignite Talk goes. Now we're going to watch Georg. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't have his, his slides timed, so we're going to all put our watches on and w see how he does. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to cheat with a clicker, but next time I promise I'll do this as good as you did. So why does inner source matter? Uh, the short version of my opinion is because people matter. And companies are made up of people, so if inner source is better for the people, it's also, by extension, better for the companies. So let's spend a moment and think what companies today want, or say they want. So what do they want? They want to be attractive and get the best people on board, the rock stars. And then once they have them on board, they want them to execute with passion. They want, to show, want them to show initiative and unleash their full creative potential. That's what companies want. And to be perfectly honest, a company and that would, and that would happen like this, that would be an awesome company to work for, wouldn't it? it? It would probably also be more resilient, more competitive. It would be fantastic. But there is a catch. And the catch is that these human capabilities here are things that cannot really be managed in the traditional way. So you can compel your economically dependent employees to be obedient, to be diligent. You can hire and recruit the most intellectually capable ones, but you cannot command passion or command initiative. Like if I go to Denise and say, you have to increase your passion level by 20% or else you can forget your bonus. <laughs> That's obviously not going to work. Um, yeah, exactly. So what I'm saying is that these capabilities are, are quite literally gifts. And the job of a company, of a successful company, is to create an environment that inspires people to volunteer these gifts. That's the job. But how to do this, I wonder? Certainly not this way. And it's not news to the companies today. Actually, I was, I was on a seminar a couple of weeks back, and then I learned that we're now moving away from the old style of management, transactional leadership, towards transformational leadership, which means, or which is defined by gaining trust, conveying a sense of purpose, sparking enthusiasm, sparking creativity, and also fostering individual growth. That's what we're being told today. That's what we should do in the future. Is that actually something that the developers want, I wonder? Let's ask this guy here, Dan Pink. He's written a book on uh, what motivates people. And the management summary is this. There are three things that you need, three ingredients that you need in order to get your people motivated. The first one is purpose. You want to know the why you're doing things. You want to buy into the why, into the purpose. That's number one. The second one, don't micromanage your people. Give them autonomy on how they reach their goals. And the last one is give them a chance to become better at what they do. Don't force them to deliver half our stuff because of some deadline which made no sense 10 years ago when it was uh, delivered. So that's what he says. And if you compare that to what trans uh, transactional leadership wants, sorry, transformational leadership, that's a pretty good match. So I would say if that's the direction companies want to go in, sounds good to me. But it doesn't tell me how to do this. And our companies are trying all sorts of things to be more cool, to you know, enter the new age. They create hackathons, they do crowdsourcing, they create inspiring new offices, all of which are good, I think. I wouldn't want to miss them. But they're very limited in that they are narrowly focused and that they are time limited or both. So that's not the long-term solution. Can you guess what the long-term solution is? <laughs> Inner source, <laughs> of course. And more specifically, it's community. That's what I think is the core of Inner source and why it is so successful. 
And it is radically different from how we work today. So in community, the basis for loyalty is no longer economic dependency, it's a shared purpose. Uh, the control is not done by bosses and policies, it's done by shared norms and aspirations. Rewards are mostly intrinsic now, not extrinsic. And finally, contributions are no longer predetermined by bosses, but are made freely. That must sound nuts in the eyes of someone who has been steeped in the old style of management. And in fact, I would say that this is really not mainstream today in most companies, not even in ours, I would say, and we've been doing it for nine years. Um, so don't be afraid though, don't be these guys. <laughs> because we know, and many of you here in the room know that it does work, it can work, and it is beneficial. And we've tested this uh, at Bosch for nine years with BIOS, Bosch Internal Open Source, that's what Stefan kickstarted. Um, and what we've learned along the way is that it is hugely attractive for the developers. It is, we've seen an explosion of creativity and also cre um, productivity. We've seen that it helps developers get better at their job, that it accelerates learning, and surprisingly, for some developers, it helped them um, avoid the management track. They stayed on the technical topic and made a career that way, and we're more happy as a result, I think. For me personally, it was quite simply the best time of my professional life so far. And it's been 31 years now, so that says something, I guess. So, and now we're seeing encouraging signs that actually the culture is changing, but very, very slowly. But I think we're getting there. So to summarize, I think InnoSource makes the developers more happy and the companies more happy. And you could say that InnoSource is at the intersection of what developers want and what the companies want. So the question, why does InnoSource matter, rather becomes, if you're not doing it already, why are you not doing it already? Because it's obviously solving so many problems. Uh, full disclosure, I took much of what I said here from uh, a foreword of this guy, Gary Hamill, in this book, uh, The Open Organization. It's a very good book. I've, if you want to read it, it's fantastic. It describes the company that I would like to work in. And that's it. May the source be with you. <laughs> <laughs>
each one of those community members can jump in if you have like uh, a different schedule, you have to take care of your uh, sick kid. So it's really about openness. So being open for others to join can really help you um, because you get a lot of support from the community, which is pretty awesome and not standard for most of the other development projects you currently or most of us are doing in the company. Um, the second thing is your completely work schedule is changing. So I was completely working different business hours, so to speak, like being in a different time zone. And this is where InnoSource actually really helps. So like across countries and stuff like that. And if you have to have the same schedule, then it uh, really is a good thing. And the thing about InnoSource, which helped me the most here, was about transparency. So the idea is to put out everything transparently as you can and sharing knowledge. So no matter what time I was decided to work, I always could read up what was happening and I could start there. This was really awesome. Um, the next thing was about like figuring out how to do things. You'd, so if you are like a full-time dad and a part-time associate, you have to do things differently than you were doing them before. And the whole framework of InnoSource uh, gives you the possibility to actually find your way through that. So we call that self-determination. So there is no fixed path. You don't have to do it every time the same way. You can figure it out and then you apply it if it works with your team and then you go for it. So you have the decision you, you can actually take, which is really a, a good thing to, to have. And uh, the last thing about the culture, which is like um, being about meritocracy. So I was like, when I started a maintainer and I shifted slightly due to the fact that I uh, was time limited towards the contributor. And others were jumping in as a maintainer, which is pretty awesome. And if you let it happen, it's actually kind of cool to go back to a contributor uh, and not being a maintainer, which is like, you're heavily loaded when you are a maintainer, but a contributor, um, being a contributor is even, uh, as uh, interesting as being a maintainer. And there are a couple of things, uh, other things which helped me, like uh, to work with an awesome team, that surely helps. So it's the best team I've ever worked with since so far. And also have the right manager or leader um, that supports this kind of, of um, thing to do. Um, yeah, try to organize your stuff, not only professionally, we are used to do it professionally, but you really have to organize your private stuff as well. Because if you do that, you figure out that you are still able to do a lot of things you did not imagine which were able doing before. So, and this is also like very important or was important for me, start prioritizing, especially private things. So what do you have to do actually right now and what can you do later or what can, even, uh, what can you even skip, so to speak? And if you do that right, you will figure out that there is still time left to, at least for some of your hobbies, to, to pop in back again. So I, I started riding motorbikes half a year ago again, so and I'm pretty happy about that. So it, it really helps. Um, yeah. So uh, in conclusion, what I want to say is basically, um, from my experience, what I figured out is that with the help of inner source, you can actually manage to be a full-time dad and still be a valuable associate to your company and, and change things in your company on a broader scale. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you.